Marilyn Fry gives us an account of sexism. She actually gives it to us at the end of the article, but for clarity and presentation's sake, I'm going to move it right up to the beginning. So for her, the uh, term sexist characterizes cultural and economic structures, which create and enforce the elaborate and rigid patterns of sex marking and sex announcing, which divide the species along lines of sex into dominators and subordinates. So we'll talk about sex marking and sex announcing um, shortly. Uh, but what's important here is to see that sexism not only divides the species, but does so in a way uh, that enforces sexist oppression. So it divides the species along lines of sex into dominators and subordinates. Individual acts and practices are sexist, which reinforce and support those structures, either as culture or as shapes taken on by the enculturated animals. So we can call any individual act or any individual practice sexist if it supports this structure of um, oppression. And this can happen either uh, as culture or as the shapes taken on by those who are encultured by that culture. Resistance to sexism is that which undermines those structures by social and political action and by projects of reconstruction and revision of ourselves. So we resist sexism when we resist that sexist culture, or we resist the enculturation that's been imposed upon us, and uh, this in furtherance of the breakdown of the sexist division, um, which yields oppression. So sexism is not just a problem insofar as sex is used in cases in which it is irrelevant. So she offers this um, conception at the very beginning uh, that she works through and actually decides against, which is this idea that sex is used in cases where it is irrelevant. But what she wants to say is, no, the problem is very much so that sex is relevant in many aspects of our lives. So what's wrong in the case of sexism is, in the first place, that sex is relevant. And then that the making of distinctions on the basis of sex reinforces the patterns which make it relevant. So that's the criticism. It's not that um, you're using sex in a, in a case where sex otherwise wouldn't be relevant. She's saying, no, there, we live in a system that enculturates us to always pay attention to sex. And so then sex becomes relevant in our social context. And that's a problem. That's, that's the issue. So sex is present in everything that we do. We have interactions that are reserved for women, and we have interactions that are reserved for men. As an, and as an aside, this is partly what um, some non-binary people report is so problematic. People just don't know how to respond to people when they don't know how to gender them. So when does this happen? Well, it happens in how we greet one another, down from um, the duration of eye contact, frequency and duration of touch, the tone and the pitch of voice that we use, physical distance between bodies, how and whether we smile, whether we use slang or swear words. We also use it in our language when we say guys, ladies, sir, ma'am, boy, cute, pretty, handsome, etc. Now, she does remark that English is a rather, is, is not as gendered as say some, say romance languages. She uses the example of Hebrew. Uh, but nevertheless, we have this language and we have these practices and we have these ways of behaving around each other that are greatly influenced by uh, sex that would not make sense unless we sex a person a particular way. So when we don't know the gender of someone or their gender is one in with which that we are not familiar, we tend to be awkward or uncertain with how to relate to them. So the practice uh, is clearly pervasive and it's deeply entrenched. And it's actually striking. Uh, if you read her article, she finds it quite puzzling and striking just how important this is, right? When you think about it, it becomes very weird when we realize that our knowledge of someone's sex or whether someone has, a, in this case, a penis or a vagina or whether their reproductive cells produce sperm or ova or whether they are primarily pumping estrogen or testosterone, this knowledge is of first importance. It is something that we need to know prior to our knowing how to relate to that person in some way. So given heteronormativity, one has to know what sex another person is before even one can allow one's heart to beat or one's blood to flow 
and erotic enjoyment. So her idea here is that heteronormativity demands that we are not seen as gay or we, we not uh, we comply with the standards of heterosexuality. And uh, this is so overwhelmingly important that uh, it leads us to having to know, like instead of just the bare, do I find this person attractive? Am I inter interested in them? I have to know what their sex or their their gender is first. Um, that's the the kind of pull or the push here. Given that we think that this is very important or it, it has become of first importance, it's very important for us to announce our gender. So we feel great need to inform everybody all the time about our sex. If you were to strip us down, we tend not to have so great a difference between each other than the common narrative indicates. That's another way of saying individual variation is actually quite large between uh, within groups, within women, within men, within people that are assigned male, within people that are assigned female. Nevertheless, uh, we think that there is quite a difference. To announce our gender, what reinforces this conception or this view of difference is the way that we adorn ourselves. We deck ourselves out from head to toe with garments and decorations, and these serve like badges and buttons to announce our sexes. For every type of occasion, there is a distinct set of clothing, gear, accessories, hairdos, cosmetics, and scents labeled as ladies or men's, and labeling us as females or males. And most of the time, most of us choose, use, wear, or bear the paraphernalia associated with our sex. I mean, this happens to such a great extent. There's a subreddit called Needlessly Gendered, and it's just a list of things, right? So here's a man card. You have been recognized as a fully fledged manly man. It's a gift card. Great. There's different kinds of kinder eggs, one for girls, one for boys, uh, dog birthday treats, one's in a pink packaging and one's in a blue packaging, um, poems for, for men, uh, laxatives for women versus just what laxatives, they're the exact same ingredients, porter potties, Miss Monopoly, that movie's less egregious, I, I'm not sure. Hero all-purpose cleaner for men. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. A men's cheese board? <laughs> okay. So, you, I mean, you get the idea. There's also this phenomena as an aside. It's called the pink tax, which generally is that um, the things that women tend to buy, the things that are, you know, these pink ones, not in this case, but sometimes you'll find that like uh, women's products or labeled women's products are more expensive than the kind of standard or men's, it's usually taken to be standard, the men's version. So razors, for example, women's razors tend to be more expensive than men's. Um, this concept also extends to the fact that just being a woman, you have to buy certain other things uh, as well. Okay, so cool, um, you get the idea. I mean, here it is, actually here it is right here, right? So uh, the men's prehistoric Rex fancy dinosaur suit is 40 pounds and the women's is 60 pounds. Okay. Okay, so we have these clothes, we have these presentations, we have these items that we, uh, we gender or we sex. If we fail to do so, uh, we are punished from critical to indignant to um, hostile reactions. So non-binary folks, again, they tend to experience this when they go into a particular bathroom or just being out in public, they can be um, targeted for harassment simply because they're not appropriately, quote unquote, announcing their sex. This happens too. I, I don't know if anyone watching this is of the age to have friends that are having kids, uh, or at least where that's uh, fairly common. But I'm around a lot of people that are having kids and um, people get very upset if they don't know the gender of a child, which I find is very interesting because all that that would be telling someone is whether the child has a penis or a vagina, at least usually in most contexts, that's what someone's communicating. Um, people will get very upset if they're, they're not informed how they should treat the child. And then once they get that knowledge, they'll 
say things like, oh, you're going to be so pretty when you grow up, or you're going to be such a lady killer when you grow up. So you get these multi-levels of uh, sexist associations and heterosexist associations or examples of heteronormativity. Now, to appear heterosexual, one actually has to do this very emphatically and very unambiguously. So there's a phenomena in a lesbian communities called femme erasure, where uh, femmes are gay women that tend to perform femininity, but they, by performing femininity, they tend to get read as heterosexual, and then um, that becomes kind of a, a problem for the dating pool. There's plenty of memes about how to appropriately signal that you are queer um, in, in a variety of contexts, right? I'm sure you can find them. Okay, so given that we reinforce gender by the kinds of behaviors and clothing we wear, what mannerisms we cultivate, and so on, we are led to believe that there really are two distinct and sharply dimorphic biological sexes. So I'm going to call this the veil, like we're under a veil uh, thinking that this is the way it works, or maybe rose-colored glasses or colored glasses or something like that would be a better description. In reality, we um, hopefully by this time in the course, we realize that there really are not just two. We construct the world in which men are, are men and women are women. We construct the world where there is male and female. There's nothing, uh, and, the, and the idea that there's nothing in between. And we do so chemically. We also do it surgically. We also go through great lengths to impose this order on our bodies. So if we feel like we're drifting too far into one category when we should be in the other, well, we can fix things through surgery, through chemical alterations, through hormone therapies. There's plenty of cosmetics, cosmetic regimens, diets, exercise, and clothing that's made to hide anything from, at least in the case of women, the too hairy lip, the too large a breast, the too slender shoulder, the too large a feet, the too great uh, or slight a stature. Um, and we tend to willingly participate in this practice. So the bodies that we have in the world are not just neatly separated into these two categories. We tend to have to discipline our bodies to do so. And we willingly do so, most of us. Since we give so many signals and so often, according to information theory, we would then have good reason to start believing that it's incredibly important that others see us this way. So in information theory, if you want to make sure that information is, is received by someone you want to receive it, you send it multiple times and you send it loudly. And then when you receive information that's the same multiple times and loudly, you tend to think, okay, well, that must be a very important thing that this person wants me to know. And the same thing happens in our gender performance or the way that we display what sex we are. That you know my sex is a very important thing. Now, ironically, we think it's very important that everyone know about what we or what body parts we have but we do everything we can to hide the very features that would, at least according to the standard view of gender dimorphism, make it clear. So we tend to want to cover up, except in very intimate circumstances, that we are one sex or another. And just we're working within a sex binary here um, when we're talking about the standard view of, of sex and gender. That's the one that Fry's critiquing. So we are made to feel this thing is very important but we don't actually see its importance displayed in any kind of mundane task. So for example, we don't need to know someone's gender for them to fill up our water at a restaurant. So if not mundanely important, then it must be what? Transcendently important, which then suggests that it's very important indeed. And this is the kind of nice um, quizzical comment that she gives. It's quite a spectacle really when one sees it, these humans so devoted to dressing up and acting out and fixing one another. So everyone lives up to and lives out the theory that there are two sharply distinct sexes and never the twain shall overlap or be confused or conflated. These hominids constantly and with remarkable lack of embarrassment, marking a distinction between two sexes as though their lives depended on it. She makes this nice comment of, look, Queer folk are commonly criticized for engaging in drag, at least historically. But what do heterosexuals do when they go out dressed for the evening? So she suggests heterosexual critics of queer's role-playing 
really ought to look themselves in the mirror on their way out for a night on the town to see who's really in drag. The answer is, everybody is. The main difference is that when queers go forth in drag, they know they're engaged in theater, whereas heterosexuals take themselves, according to Fry, to be playing in the real world. So we have these different categories. We are compelled to present and we often comply with those demands of presentation. So what? Well, for her, she points out that announcing that one is a man generally tends to benefit you and announcing one as a, oneself as a woman tends not, it tends to hinder your protection or your safety. So when a man announces himself in the street that he is a man, this tends towards their protection or their safety. While for women, it tends towards her victimization. It invites harassment and threats of violence. A man's generally announces respect or strength. Though I think it's important to note that this can vary depending on your race. Announcing oneself as a black man, for example, can open you up to a lot more harassment than um, it would if you were a, a white male. Women's clothing is also restrictive. It's binding, it's burdening, it's frail. It threatens to fall apart or uncover something that is supposed to be covered if you bend, reach, kick, punch, or run. Women are expected to take up little space, to defer to others, to be silent or affirming. Men don't have this. Men are tend to uh, expect that they should take up space. So we have cases of like the common phenomena of man spreading or not moving uh, for people on the street. There's this kind of assumption that that space is theirs to take up. A woman, when she speaks, is supposed to be self-deprecating. Otherwise, she'll come off as a bitch. So Fry's point is that these forces that mark and announce us help then to constitute the oppression of women. So what about biology? How does that play into this? Are, are these natural or essential differences? She wants to say no. If you look at what it actually does, the functional role of sex announcing and sex um, delineation, if the role is to constitute the oppression of women, well, then look at it from that perspective. It's very costly to forcibly oppress people, to get people to comply always. A less costly way is to convince the oppressed that it's inevitable, natural, essential, or in their own interest. If anyone has ever read John Gaventa's work, this would be the third dimension of power. Convince that someone that it's in their interest, convince them that this is the way that it has to be, or the only way that it's been, or the way that it will be, that there's no hope in stri striking against it. This is just who you are because of how you've been born. The more separate and different that we make two different groups, the dominated and the dominating, the more convincing it is that the two groups really are naturally distinct. So here's a nice quote. That we are trained to behave so differently as women and as men, and to behave so differently towards women and towards men, that itself contributes mightily to the appearance of extreme natural dimorphism. But also, the ways we act as women and as men, and the ways we act towards women and towards men, it actually molds our bodies and our minds to the shapes of subordination and dominance. We do become what we practice. Enculturation and socialization are not just a mere gloss over some biological substratum. This is not just a matter of nature versus nurture. Because there exists an enormous pressure on us to behave feminine or masculine. We don't really know how we could be otherwise without these behavior patterns. It's very hard to know to what extent being a woman or being a man or performing femininity or performing masculinity is natural because we are constantly bullied and pressured into performing one way or another to the point that we don't really remember a time when it wasn't that, that way. I mean, when you look at people and the way that they behave towards babies, 
Gendering happens immediately. It happens before birth. It happens when people try to decide how they want their baby room to look like. So it's hard to know what our natural inclinations are. Furthermore, we don't even know what the other social pressures that might go into um, building up our conceptions of what gender we are, what sex we are, or how we announce it. So someone might object, look, people are very stuck in their roles though. And she points out that, you know, men tend to be very um, resistant to changing uh, their ways. That's her kind of example. And there's a, co a current example in the case of coronavirus um, that men tend to not wear masks, right? Um, whereas women tend to wear masks. So you might commonly see people wearing um, women with their kids wearing masks and then um, their partner or their husband or, or a man with them uh, is not wearing a mask. And there's this like puzzle, like why not wear masks? Like what's going on there? How do we get men to wear masks and comply with the health standards? Um, it's very difficult to get them to do so. And in some studies, the reports were that um, men found that it made them feel like they were not masculine enough or that they were showing weakness or something like that. Okay, so note that not everyone of the same gender, so in response to this idea, why are people so stuck in their roles if it's not biology? Well, note that not everyone of the same gender actually enacts those roles similarly. So if you look at different race class intersections, this can show that people are actually wildly different, even though they share the same biology. Habits, though, she's, she notes, we should not underestimate how habits are deeply bodily. So they might be deeply bodily, but that doesn't mean it's genetically determined. So she suggests, think about the habit of driving home. You take the same course home, or people often take the same course home, almost just automatically. Or think of the way that you brush your teeth. Or think of the way that you do your morning routine. Think of the way you twirl your hair when you're thinking. These habits, they are, they are mapped onto one's body. It's not really a matter of a decision that you make, a mental event. It's not a, it's not a decision that's repeated each day upon daily reflection and rejudgment of the reasonableness of the course of action. But it's also not genetic. She points out that we're animals, so learning is really physical, it's bodily. So she points out, socialization, it molds our bodies, and enculturation forms our skeletons our musculature, our central nervous systems. By the time we are gendered adults, masculinity and femininity are biological. Now that doesn't mean that they're immutable. They are changeable just as one would expect bodies to be, slowly, through constant practice, and deliberate regimens designed to remap and rebuild nerve and tissue. So her point is that biological at that point doesn't mean genetically determined or inevitable. It just means of the animal. And this is just a nice point for how effective and deeply penetrating different systems and institutions can be in our lives. It changes the very way that we move our bodies, the ways we think of our own identities, the ways we relate to other people, to a point that we, it's, it's almost invisible to us. It's not until perhaps someone violates those norms or violates those principles that we recognize um, the difficulties and the, uh, the issues. Unfortunately, all too common, the response is to see that person who's violating those norms as somewhat unnatural. The problem is them. They're failing to satisfy some standard or something like that instead of recognizing that perhaps we ourselves have internalized certain norms and expectations. Now, insofar as these norms and expectations split us into dominators and subordinates, this is gonna be a system of oppression. So that's what sexism is at the end of the day. I'll, I'll reiterate with a restatement of the uh, definition. The term sexist characterizes cultural and economic structures which create and enforce the elaborate and rigid patterns of sex marking and sex announcing which divide the species along lines of sex into dominators and subordinates. Individual acts and practices then are sexist 
which reinforce and support those structures, either as culture or as shapes taken on by the enculturated animals. Resistance to sexism is that which undermines those structures by social and political action and by projects of reconstruction and revision of ourselves. Now we're gonna next turn to what happens when someone resists sexism. What happens when someone resists the norms and expectations of patriarchy? That's what we see um, with man's conception of misogyny. <laughs> 